Thank you guys. That was amazing. Thanks. Thanks. Thank we you. Had a, we had a lot of questions come in uh, on your groove, so maybe you can uh, say what you just uh, what you just did there. Is that like something rehearsed, or did you just come in? Uh, basically, we just rehearsed it now, <laughs> about an hour ago. Yeah. Um, one of the songs I um, I wrote in my hotel room last night, uh, and then the other one we kind of just jammed from yeah. four chords. And then the third one is, is one that I, I wrote a while back and uh, myself and Derek have done before, but Paul's never done, never done before it. today. So so. Paul's been thrown in at the deep end. <laughs> We've been winging it, basically, <laughs> big time. Amazing. 
<laughs> we, have, uh, we have a question from Pierre Bonnet for all the guys. Uh, which song do you like uh, the most to play live? Do you have any preferences? Out of the Jamiroquai yes. stuff. Well, uh, I like Runaway, personally. Mm. I really like that groove, because it involves everyone in the groove's quite up there. It's quite energetic, fantastic chorus, um, and also the band can actually play out a bit towards the end, so it's, um, it's a really good grooving up-tempo track. Yeah, I'd, I'd go with that. I've been enjoying yeah. that track. There's very few that aren't great fun to play. I mean, all of them are great fun to play, really. Yeah. Um, and we, you know, Jay likes to throw different songs in from time to time, so we do do a lot of different tunes. But I would agree with Runaway. We've been playing Don't Give It a Chance over the last few nights. That's yeah. been good fun. I always, uh, we've done Virtual Insanity quite a few times. That's always great fun to play. But some of the stock tunes, I mean, Little L, I love playing. Yeah. Mm. Uh, you know, um, basically the whole show. Yeah, they're all. <laughs> yeah. I'm enjoying Shake It On as well at the moment. Yeah. The new it song, there's, it, just because it nine. sounds so good yeah. on the big stage. I mean, it's the new songs have translated very well from the album to the stage, so that's yeah. been good fun whenever we've done any of those. Yeah, yeah definitely. And uh, a, a question came in for Derek. Uh, someone uh, was looking at your ghost notes, saying, how do you practice, how do you <laughs> practice your ghost notes? Um, I'll, I'll be honest, um, it's just through... Believe it or not, I still take lessons, and I've actually had a couple of lessons from a guy called Kaz Rodriguez, who's playing at a London drum show today, I believe. And he just showed me some of the things that he's practiced. So I've just basically taken what he's shown me, u used that, but then also adapted it to my way. But it's, it's really a case of just um, practicing the ghost notes at a low, at slow tempo, and then slowly building up to, uh, to speed. That's comfortable. So obviously, with these these type of tracks, and I love playing this kind of music, to to actually d to do them is um, a how can I call it? It's a treat. <laughs> it's a treat. So um, it's it's just something that I, you, just, you just practice from slow, doing your d the normal uh, uh, rudiments and everything, and then you just 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 build it up. Add in the accents from the first beat, first note, then the second note, then the third note and the fourth note, and every other note needs to be a grace note, so to speak. A question came in uh, for you, Matt, from Nico Kanakaris. Oh, um, Nico, yes. What album or artist got you into playing music and keyboards? Um, Is there one? Well, that's just an interesting question. I'm trying to think what the first things, the first things I actually listened to were kind of rock things, actually, like, because my older brother had records, you know, so it was David Bowie and Jimi Hendrix and the Beatles and stuff like that. And then I think, then I started discovering soul music later on, when I, especially when I moved into London. And then I was involved in, I became involved in the R&B scene in London a lot. And, you know, I mean, keyboard players. My favourite keyboard player is actually Greg Fillingaines, you know, who's not really a, probably the most famous keyboard player. But he's, you've heard him on so many records, he's on everything, and he's just so tasteful and inspiring, you know. And I, I'm more inspired about how someone's playing fits into a song, you know. I'm more interested in the song, really, than individual musicians. So, so that's a very convoluted answer to a simple question. <laughs> but, you know, I, th I think, you know, from, from what we're doing here, obviously I'm inspired by Herbie and Stevie Wonder, like everyone else, you know. Yeah. A uh, question came in from Mark O'Brien for Paul. Uh, what tips do you have uh, for a bass player who wants to progress from being a great bassist to being part of a great rhythm section? Uh, from already being uh, an accomplished bassist to going to rhythm section um, and, and, and kind of taking that onto another level, I, if, if that's the question, I would say the obvious answer has to be to play with drummers and other rhythm section players all of the time. I would include um, Matt or keyboard players in that, obviously percussionists and, um, and pl guitar players like, like Rob who have such great rhythm. Um, but playing, it's, it's a case of really trying to um, always be able to adapt to whatever rhythm section you're playing in and immediately kind of find a way to fit in with a different drummer or or fit in with the same drummer and really perfect that so that you end up just sounding like a, a, a really great unit. Um, I don't necessarily go along with the, the, um, the thing of practicing with a metronome all of the time. That is a, it's a good source of um, 
practicing your time keeping, but it, you also need to practice without a metronome to develop your time and internal clock. But I think when it comes to playing with other rhythm sections it's, or other drummers and becoming a part of a great rhythm section, it's really about listening and, um, and trying to make sure that you kind of find the places that you should just fit in. And it doesn't mean sitting on the back of the beat if the drummer's sitting on the back of the beat. It often, that might mean kind of holding holding the line or holding it back if the drummer's pushing it. They can just, you just need to kind of find those places that make you feel like you want to dance it and, or that it, the music is, is, has the right feel. So you just kind of slot in like that. And it's really, it's always just through lots of listening to good music and playing as much as you can. Cool. Uh, technical question for you, Matt. Um, using the montage on stage, uh, question is how do, how do you use which parts of the the montage do you use on stage? Well, the, the great thing about the montage is the scenes for me, really, on, st on stage, you know, because whereas before mid-song you'd have to fumble on a screen to find another patch, you know, I can program up, I could have eight completely different sounds on the same patch, which is always going to cover me in a song, and it can be like this, this one's split here and suddenly it's something completely different. So that's really handy. Um, that's the thing I use most, and then I suppose the 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 exp uh, you know the expression pedal can be really useful. I use it a lot for the wah on the clav, so you can really approximate a clav quite quite closely with the wah. Um, filter sweeps, stuff like that, can all be done on there. But yeah, I'd, I'd say the scenes is really for me the the deal breaker. <laughs> this makes it great live. And another question from Matthew Nickel for Paul. Um, Matthew is playing Canned Heat for an addition on bass. Do you have any tips for him? Um, with all, any bass part, you, you really want to try to make sure that you groove with the, the and I know that word is kind of so um, commonly used and, th and thrown away, but you want it to, to bounce in the right way. And, and um, the thing that I always, well, I was told that I did, and I now kind of try to, um, offer as a piece of an advice for somebody wanting my way or whatever. Not that that's necessarily going to be the only way, but um, I just think that if you listen to a tune and you find that pocket and you really kind of listen to it and get inside what that tune is trying to do, however that makes you feel, you should be aiming. So if that makes you kind of move in a certain way or bounce your foot or nod your head, you should be doing that when you're playing. And if you're kind of able to replicate that same feeling, then you're going to be along the, the right lines for the to make the tune work. Cool. I think that's a great uh, last word. Thank you so much, guys, for coming Thank out. And, and uh, have a great time on tour yeah, to Europe. Thank you. See you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>